Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the liquidity preference framework. So what exactly is the liquidity preference framework? Ultimately, what this is getting at, this is going to be that model that we're going to build up that's going to evaluate the trade-off between money and bonds to say, hey, all of our wealth as a nation or all of our wealth as people, we can choose to either hold it as money, and we've already talked about what that means by money, or we can choose to hold it as bonds. And bonds, again, that was the previous video, we evaluated what we mean by bonds and the relationship with them. Now with the liquidity preference framework, well, as in the name, we kind of assume underneath this model that you and I, people in general, have a preference um, for liquidity. That is that we can access our funds and buy stuff if we need to. So following off on that assumption, we ultimately build up our model to determine why we hold money, how much money we decide to hold, and why we hold bonds and how many bonds we decide to hold similarly. Now, often we get kicked back on this and we go, hey, this is a little bit simplistic. Uh, I don't just hold my resources. I don't just hold my wealth as money or bonds. I mean, in reality, there's stocks, there's mutual funds, um, there's commodities. There's all these other ways that I could save my net worth, that I could save my wealth. And yeah, you're right. There truthfully is. But if we look at financial markets on whole, Bonds are by far and large the largest source of financial intermediation, financial instruments altogether, where we save, where uh, firms and others end up borrowing from. So it's really not that big of an exaggeration. It's not that big of a simplification to just simply say, hey, all of our wealth is split between money and bonds. And truthfully, if we wanted to add in little things like stocks, commodities, real estate, all of the additional things that also make up this, well, it can just be tacked on just easily enough. So this abstraction, this step away from reality, really isn't going to be that drastically changing um, in the way that we're going to explain it in this 104 sense versus how it would be actually explained in a full model. And again, that comes back to the fact that the bond markets are just massive in relation to the other markets out there. So, okay, bit of background there. What exactly are we going to go through with this video? Well, so the first thing, we've already said this a few times. Our first objective is to understand that wealth can simplistically be held as either money or bonds. That's going to be our two kind of categories in which we can split our wealth between. Our second objective is that we're going to determine equilibrium interest rates. So, hey, where does the interest rate come from? Why is the current interest rate for this, this amount, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We're going to determine where these equilibrium interest rates come from, and we're going to do so by utilizing this liquidity preference framework. Finally, we're going to utilize this liquidity preference framework to explain how agents, so economic agents, that's you and I or firms, how we transition between cash and bonds. Why sometimes we might decide to hold more cash, why sometimes we decide to hold more bonds, and how that transitioning between them ends up affecting our interest rate. We'll finish off this by taking a look at how all of this all together transmits through to affect our macroeconomic equilibrium. That is how it pushes all the way through to affect our aggregate demand, aggregate supply. So that would be our fourth objective there, is understand how changes in our liquidity preference framework ultimately end up affecting equilibrium in aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. Okay, well then, let's jump over, let's start taking a look at that, and let's introduce the basics of our liquidity preference framework. Okay, so let's start off with this whole basic premise that we have, that we have all of our wealth, that this wealth can either be held as money, or as bonds. And underneath this whole pre um, basis of our liquidity preference framework is ultimately saying that, hey, you know what? Between the two, we would rather hold it as money. We have a preference for liquidity, and thus money is king, right? Cash is king. This is the whole thing there. And, well, okay, sure, I can say that, but really, why, right? Why would that be the case? Well, okay, there's a few reasons why that would be the case, but ultimately kind of getting back to a bit of a micro idea is that we are utility maximizing. Utility 
maximizing. And that is we're going to maximize our utility through consumption. And how do we finance this consumption? Well, we need money to buy those things for us. So that is money is primarily what we want so that we can actually buy the stuff we need and want. However, sometimes, right, and this would be a great problem to have, sometimes we have more money than we need for our current consumption. When we have more money than we need for our current consumption, well, then all of that extra money that we don't need for today's consumption, we can go and we can put into bonds for tomorrow's consumption, right? We can save this, we can put this aside for later or tomorrow. So in this way here, we have a trade-off between the two. We're going to have a degree of money we want to hold for our present consumption with anything extra being thrown into bonds, being saved away, squirreled away for another day for tomorrow's consumption. But you have to keep in mind that there's, there's going to be a cost to this, right? We don't want to put too much money away into bonds because the process of buying and selling bonds is not frictionless. There is actually a cost to buying and selling bonds, and that's going to be our transaction costs, right? Every time you buy a bond, every time you sell a bond, there's going to be a time lag in that and the process to buy and sell. This is, of course, decreasing with our ability to buy and sell these online digitally, but there's still a slight transaction cost in this process. On the flip side of that, well, on the flip side of that, there's also a cost to holding money, right? It's not just free to hold money. There is every time we decide to hold a dollar as cash, a dollar as money, well, we're giving up the interest rate. We're giving up that rate of return that we could have earned on the bonds. So, okay, we see that there's a balancing act going on here. On the one hand, we want to hold money to finance our current, our present period consumption. But if we hold too much money, while well, we're facing higher and higher costs from that money that we hold from that foregone interest rate we could have earned. On the flip side, we could throw our wealth into bonds, but the problem with throwing all of our wealth into bonds is that every time we want to go buy something, we would have the cost that we'd have to liquefy the bond, we'd face the transaction cost, the time cost, all of that to transition this illiquid bond into liquid cash. So we face some constraints on either side. Now we've already said, yes, we have the preference for money, but we see that, hey, holding money in itself does have this opportunity cost, which is thus why we will still tend to hold some of our wealth as bonds. So, okay, that's, that's the idea there. Ultimately, let's take a look at the big reasons as to why we want money. Big reasons as to why we want to hold money over bonds. Now, there's going to be three of these altogether. The first reason that we're going to hold money over bonds is to satisfy our transactional demand. And this is this is that demand that we were just talking about. This is that demand that we are going to have saying, hey, you know what? I know roughly what my monthly budget is. I know what my monthly expenses are, how much is going towards my rent, my cell phone, my car payments, my insurance, my groceries, on and on and on and on. Right? We have this idea as to how much money is going to flow out. Well, we want to maintain enough money in order to be able to satisfy this transactional demand. So that every time we go to buy groceries, we don't have to go and pull a bunch of bonds out of the bond market, facing those transaction costs, those time costs, etc. So first reason why we're going to hold a certain level of money is in order, in order to satisfy this transactional demand. In that you can imagine... If for some reason you decide to buy more stuff forever into the future, or if for some reason prices were to go up forever into the future, well, similarly, you're going to need more money in order to satisfy that transactional demand. So we would have that as part of it. The second part, and this is, this is becoming significantly less, is we're going to have what's going to be called our precautionary demand. And this precautionary demand, this is going to be excess money, excess cash that we want to carry around above and beyond our transactional demand, just in case, right? Maybe all of a sudden we have our car breakdown and we need a whole bunch of extra money in order to pay for that. 
or maybe the alternative, there's a really good sale on and you need to go and buy a bunch of extra stuff that was beyond your typical transactional demand. So this here is just kind of extra precautionary funds that you tend to carry around just to be able to satisfy those one-off events that may occur. Now I said this is decreasing, right? This is decreasing actually quite drastically as we move through time. And the reason being is that originally, right, a lot of these are old theories that, well, I shouldn't say old, macro as a whole discipline is relatively new, but throwing back to say 60s, 70s, 80s, which I guess is old enough. In that case there, well, if you wanted to spend money, if you wanted to buy something, you actually needed physical cash. And so as a result, you would carry around enough cash to meet your daily obligations, that's your transactional demand, and then you would carry around a little bit extra in order to satisfy this precautionary demand. Of course, with the rise of modern banking, with the rise of electronic funds transfers, and specifically with the rise of credit cards, there is less and less need for people to be carrying around these excess money, excess resources, as a just in case. It's not like, oh my goodness, my car broke down, ah, I can't get it fixed because the bank's closed right now and I can't get the cash to pay for it. No, 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 for most people, their car broke down, even if the bank's closed, well, they can use their credit card, they can use their debit card in order to still make those payments. So precautionary demand, it's still, it's still there, but it's a shrinking aspect of our reasons or our demand for money. Our final case, our final kind of reason why we're going to carry money is going to be our speculative demand. And of course, what have we said so far? Transactional demand, this is our biggest reason as to why we want to hold some amount of money, some amount of cash. Precautionary demand, this is a shrinking reason as to why we want to hold it. Speculative demand, this is, this is our most volatile. This is the most volatile rationale we have as to why we want to hold cash. And what really, what's going on here? What's going on with our speculative demand? Well, this is going on based off of the kind of how we finished off our bonds chapter. That is going to be based off of speculation on what's happening in bonds markets. And that is, it might be, we might decide, hey, you know what? We're going to think something's going to happen in the bond market such that bond prices are going to crash. Well, hey, if bond prices are going to crash, I'm going to sell my bond portfolio today. I'm going to move into money. So that's going to be a spike in my money demand, my speculative demand for money. And then once these event has happened, or maybe I go, oops, I was wrong. This event never happened. Well, then I can move this money back into bonds, right? And if you kind of think about why that's the case, let's, let's just go through a kind of a brief example. Maybe you kind of forgot what we did in that bond, uh, in that bond video. Let's go through not so technical, not so mathy, but just kind of the idea as to what's going on. So let's say that you own 100 bonds and these bonds are going for $10 each. So that is altogether your bond. Your bond portfolio, what, 100 times 10, you have $1,000 in your bond portfolio. Now, for some reason, you are speculating, you believe that the interest rate, the yield to maturity on your bond portfolio is going to increase. Uh, something's going to happen, either risk is going to be increasing, and so the corresponding yields are increasing, or right, the risk-free rate's going up for some reason. Something's happening to push up this interest rate. Okay, why is this a problem? Well, as we've seen, bond prices and the yield to maturity or this interest rate are inversely related. So that is, as this interest rate goes up, you expect that, hey, your bond price is going to fall to eight. So, okay, still, you still have 100 bonds in both these cases, but if it falls to $8 per bond due to this rise in interest rate, well, your bond portfolio has fallen to $800. You've just lost $200 because of this. Well, what you could do instead, if you think this is going to happen, before it happens, and if you're right, this is, this is the big thing, if you're right, you could sell and get... $1,000 cash. Okay, so there you go. You sell your bond portfolio, you get $1,000 cash. This event occurs, 
Okay, so that event occurs, and bonds fall to $8 per bond now. But now what you can do is once these prices have fallen, you can just go and buy those bonds back. You can now buy 1,000 worth of bonds. And in this case here, right, you have your $1,000 cash because you sold when they were $10 each. You're now going to buy another $1,000 worth of bonds. But $1,000 worth of bonds at $8 each, this now allows you to buy 125 at $8 each. That's your total of $1,000. So by speculating, by believing that this is going to happen, you can back out of the market. You can quickly jump into cash, into money. This is going to be a jump in your speculative demand for money. And then once your realization has actually occurred, either correctly or incorrectly, you can then move back into the bonds. And in this case here, you've just drastically increased your uh, your bond holdings. I mean, in this case here, you have, what, increased your bond holdings by 25%. So, hey, that's that's a pretty good win. Now you're getting those coupon payments on these extra 25 bonds. You've just increased probably your uh, monthly annual income as a result of that. So one of the reasons why we might speculate and shift between the two. Of course, the opposite would also be true, right? If you were expecting interest rates to go down, well, you'd be tending to buy a bunch today and then sell the excess tomorrow at that higher price. So this, this speculative demand, of course, can go, can go both ways. So, okay, those are our three reasons to hold money, our three reasons to hold cash. Let's kind of take these and let's bring this over and actually take a look at this idea of our money demand. And with that, a money demand curve. So what we're going to be taking a look at this is ultimately going to be building up our liquidity preference frame work. And in building up this liquidity preference framework, we're going to utilize just a simple graph. And this is just going to be another supply and demand graph. But our price in this case, well, is going to be the interest rate. And why, why is interest rate the price? Well, because we're looking at money and ultimately the demand for money. And like we said in our previous case, when we were setting up this whole idea is that the cost of money is that foregone interest rate that you could have earned, right? We said that, hey, you could have put your money into a bond. Yeah, there's some issues with that, but you could have put your money into a bond. And every time, every dollar you decide to hold is cash, you have foregone some amount of interest rate. So what we end up getting is interest rate as our cost of money versus our quantity of money. And if we kind of think about how much money we want to hold all else equal just with respect to the interest rate, well, if the interest rate was really, really high, we're going to have a really high cost for every dollar we hold as cash. Every dollar we hold is cash, that's a lot that we're giving up in potential future interest. So at a really high interest rate, we're going to have high interest rate, really low quantity of money being demanded. So we can do a little dot right there at that kind of point. On the flip side of that, if the interest rate is really low, this is going to be kind of more like a modern day scenario where we're in this really super low interest rate environment. Well. If the interest rate's really low, I'm not really earning much if I move my money into bonds. So that is, I'm not really having much of a cost of holding money as money. So I have that case there. All else equal, I'll be tending to hold a higher quantity of money. So in that sense there, if we take these two points, we connect our dots, we're going to get a downward sloping line, which is our money demand curve, our demand for money altogether, how much money we want to hold. And we see that this is all else equal going to be influenced by our interest rate. The higher the interest rate, the less cash I want to hold. The lower the interest rate, well, less of a cost to hold cash, the more cash I'm going to want to hold.
Now, what's going to influence this? Uh, what's going to influence this money demand curve? What's going to cause it to dance around? What's going to cause it to shift to the right or to the left? Well, ultimately, the things that are going to cause it to shift are going to be changes in our transactional demand. Transactional demand, or alternatively, we can have changes to our speculative uh, demand. It can help if I can spell. Uh, speculative demand. There we go. So changes in transactional or speculative demand. I'm going to leave precautionary demand out because we said, hey, that's that's actually really small. And in fact, for the most part, we're even going to leave speculative demand out because, hey, this tends to be rather volatile and then short-lived and it corrects itself. So really our focus on what's going to cause this money demand curve to change is going to be changes in our transactional demand. And what causes changes in our transactional demand? Well, ultimately, it's going to be changes in the amount of stuff bought. Right? So, okay, if, and right, we're not just necessarily talking about an individual, we're talking about a whole nation. If everybody in the nation is buying more stuff, all else equal, right? Everything else in the world constant. Same prices, same interest rates, same everything. We're just buying more stuff. Well, hey, that's an expenditure of more stuff, a purchase of more stuff. That's that's uh, that's actually just a change in real GDP. And in this case here, what I just said, I said if real GDP increases, well, all else equal, in order to buy more stuff, I'm going to need more money, right? If it's the same price, if it's $2 per item, and I used to buy 100 goods, and I now want to buy 150 goods, I need more money to buy those extra 50 goods. So if I want to buy more stuff, if I'm going to have more real GDP, I'm going to need more money demand as well. So that would be my money demand curve would shift to the right. The other aspect of this, instead of a change in the amount of stuff that I buy, we're going to say a change in the prices of goods bought, or of stuff, right? So this is ultimately, in this case here, change in prices of stuff. This is a change in our price level. So again, change in price level, all else equal, that is for a constant interest rate, for a constant real GDP, if we have prices up, prices go up. Well, if prices go up, just to be able to buy the same amount of stuff that I used to be able to buy, I'm going to need more money, right? I used to buy 100 goods at $2 a good. Prices have gone up to $3 a good. Well, if I still want to buy my 100 goods, I need more money to buy that 100 goods. So that's an increase in my transactional demand. That's going to be an increase in my money demand. My money demand will shift to the right. Increase in money demand. So we see aspects that will end up changing our money demand as we move through this and really our money demand on hold. But okay, it's not a really good supply and demand diagram if we just have demand. So the other side of this, of course, is our supply. And let's just get rid of these arrows here. And what tends to happen, and I see this a lot, is that we just we get used to supply and demand diagrams and we can just go like this. Boom, there we go, money supply. That is wrong. That is wrong. Our money supply is not upward sloping. That is not, we don't create more money, right? Let's just talk about what an upward sloping money supply curve means. An upward sloping money supply curve means that, hey, if the interest rate is low, well, we supply, we print, we create just a little bit of money. If the interest rate is high, well, then we print, we create lots of money. Well, Okay, that's that's not actually the case at, at all. In fact, in this model, in this case here, we presume that the amount of money created, the amount of money being supplied to the economy on whole, is entirely independent of the interest rate. The interest rate has no impact on all at all on how much money we create. So that is, in this model, our money supply curve is just vertical, just a vertical line at some quantity of money which we've created, some quantity of money which has been printed and is now in circulation within the economy on whole. 
and we'll talk about in the upcoming videos, I believe this is going to be next week that these videos come out, these upcoming videos determining, hey, where is this money supply curve? How much money is supplied and what is this quantity supplied of money? But for now, we'll just take this as exogenous. That is, for now, we'll just take it as being outside of our system. And we'll recognize that, hey, where our money supply and our money demand equal, where they intercept each other, we get our equilibrium interest rate and we get some equilibrium quantity of money in this economy being hey some amount of money being demanded some equal to the amount of money being supplied of course in order to be able to understand why this is an equilibrium why this is stable why this is the balancing point the stable point within our economy for this we need to take a look at the disequilibrium and in taking a look at the disequilibrium we can begin to explain well what's going on here how do we get to this equilibrium point so let's start off let's start off by taking a look at a scenario where we have a low interest rate so il there for interest rate low and what we take a look at is at interest rate low well we have this well of course disequilibrium and that is we have some amount of money supplied so actually let's go quantity money supplied versus we have quantity of money demanded. And in order to be able to rationalize this, think about this, even though this is a national context, we're talking about the national economy, we're talking about everybody within the nation, their money demanded, the total amount of money supplied. I find it best to work through this model if you think about it from a personal viewpoint, right? And ultimately, that's what a lot of economics is, right? It's taking these personal things that work on an individual basis and then scaling it up, saying everyone's just kind of aggregating their own personal response. So, okay, think of a situation where you only have this amount of money supplied. So let's say you only have $100 available to you. But due to your transactional demand, speculative demand, your precautionary demand, you are needing $120. So you're $20 short. How are you going to get this extra $20? Well, keep in mind, keep in mind, let's just scroll down so I can make some room to talk about this here, is that all together you have squirreled away your wealth between money and bonds. And right now you only have $100 worth of money but you want 120. So how do you get this extra $20? How do you get this extra $20 in order to satisfy, right? You only have 100, you want 120. Well, you get that extra $20 by selling your bonds, right? You have these bonds, you're $20 short. So you begin to sell bonds in order to satisfy this excess demand, in order to get access to that money that you're wanting. But okay, now we need to take a step back and we need to say, this isn't actually just you. This is everybody in the economy going through the same dilemma. Everybody is going, I need $20. I have my money in my bonds, but I need it in cash. So what I want to do, I want to sell my bonds in order to get the cash, in order to get the money. But here's the thing, because this is national, because this is everybody in the economy, short money, everybody needs this extra money, everybody is selling bonds, who's buying? No one. No one's buying, meaning you're trying to sell your bond and there's no one buying it. So, okay, if you're trying to sell something and even just think about trying to sell something on Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace or something like that, you're trying to sell it, you really want it gone, but no one's biting, no one's buying it. How do you get it to disappear? How do you get it to go? Well, you lower the price, right? So in order to be able to actually sell the bond to get the cash, you need to be able, you need to start to sell this bond for less than you were originally hoping. 
Now, this is where we get into our relationships within the bonds between price and interest rates, or price and yield to maturities, right? We saw that, hey, as interest rate went up, price went down. As interest rate went down, price went up. Well, okay, the opposite can also be true. Changes in prices can also influence changes in interest rates. So in that case there, we're selling our bonds, we're lowering the prices. So as the price of bonds begins to drop, that yield to maturity, that interest rate received on that bond is actually increasing. Okay, hey, as interest rates begin to climb, as interest rates begin to increase here, well, we end up at this new higher interest rate such that, okay, we still have the same amount of money supplied, but, oh, higher interest rate, that's a higher cost of carrying cash. I don't quite want to have as much cash anymore. So I drop my money demand down to, I don't know, let's say this is now 110 for my new money demand. Well, keep in mind, I'm still having more money demanded than I currently have money supplied. So again. I need to sell bonds in order to satisfy this. As I sell bonds, right, and some people are selling their bonds and getting their money, but ultimately the result of this is going to be falling prices. Falling prices are going to result in increasing interest rates. This whole process is going to continue again and again and again until we wind up right back at I star, our equilibrium interest rate, such that at this equilibrium interest rate, the quantity of money being supplied is one and the same as the quantity of money that we want to actually demand due to transactional precautionary and speculative demand. Of course, this whole process works identically from the top if we had a high interest rate. So let's go, let's take a look at how we would approach that if we had a high interest rate. So let's take a look at a high interest rate. We'll use blue for that. I'm gonna go I H for interest rate high. And then similarly, we'll take a look at this high interest rate. We'll cut that across. And we notice that at this high interest rate, we have going down off of our money demand, we would have our quantity money demanded. And then all the way across to our money supply, we would have our quantity of money supplied. So let's just clean up this red bit here from the interest rate low, just to make things a little bit less messy for us. So there we go. Let's drag that guy up. And then keep in mind, this is coming from that guy there. So again, this is the national level on hold that this is occurring, that everybody on hold in this economy at this high interest rate, they have a lot more money being supplied to them than they currently have demand for. So again, to think about this is to start off by thinking about it on this personal level. And we'll start off by thinking about it on this personal level and then move up to more of the macro level. So that is on a personal level, we have, let's say again, $100 of total money supplied. So that's how much money we have available to us, $100. However, due to our day-to-day -day transactional needs, due to our speculative reasons, due to our precautionary reasons, we only need, let's say, $70. So... That is, we have an extra $30 of money that we have no need for. So, hey, if we have no need for this $30 of money, what are we going to do with it? Well, with all this excess money, we're going to go and we're going to put it into bonds. This is money we don't need to hold. And if we just hold it just for the fun of it, we incur the opportunity cost of that lost interest. So we're going to take this excess money and we're going to transfer it into those bonds. Okay. Now this is where we need to switch to think of it from this macro context. Everybody in this economy is doing that. Everybody is buying bonds. And that is if everybody's buying bonds, nobody is selling bonds. So if nobody is selling bonds, well, who are you going to buy the bond from? How are you going to entice? How are you going to get somebody to sell you their bond if no one wants to sell the bond? Well, the way you do that is you begin to offer them a higher price. You go, hey, look, you have that bond. I really want it. You are only asking 100, but hey, I'll give you 110 if you give it to me. And the person's like, okay, maybe at 110, that's worth me selling it. 
So what begins to happen in this case here is that because everybody's trying to buy bonds, we begin to bid up the price of bonds. We begin to bid up the price. The price of bonds begins to rise. Again, we have that inverse relationship between the price of bonds and the yield to maturity. That is that price of bonds and the interest rate. So as the price of bonds begins to get bid up, the interest rate or the yield to maturity on those bonds begins to fall. Again, falling interest rate. That is a falling interest rate. So this falling interest rate means that now all of a sudden our cost of holding money isn't so great. So, okay, interest rate begins to fall. Let's just update that a little bit. We're now at this new lower interest rate. Well, okay, at this new lower interest rate, I'm like, yeah, okay. At the high interest rate, I only wanted to hold $70 worth of cash. As the interest rate falls, I'm not as eager to put my money into bonds anymore, so I'll hold some extra cash. Maybe I'm going to hold $80 worth of cash now for my money to bet. Keep in mind that's still less than my money supply of 100 so I still have this discrepancy, so I'm still trying to buy bonds. As I keep trying to buy bonds, I'm going to continue to push up the price. As I continue to push up the price, the interest rate is going to continue to fall, and it continues to fall until we arrive again at this equilibrium interest rate. So we see that in this story here, Anytime the interest rate's too high, anytime the interest rate's too low, we're going to have this tendency to either try to buy or sell bonds. This process of trying to buy or sell bonds will influence the price of the bonds. As the price of the bonds changes, the interest rate begins to change, and we begin to migrate towards equilibrium. Thus, I star and our equilibrium level of money. In the economy, money supply equals money demand is upheld. So, our basis of our liquidity preference framework. Okay, well, what we have to look at next, so that's the basis of our liquidity preference framework. What happens if we have changes in this? And then, based off of what we have changes in this, how does this work through to impact our greater economy on whole? That is our macro economy, our macroeconomic equilibrium, our aggregate demand, our aggregate supply diagram. So we'll go and take a look at that as well. Really, what we should be able to notice as we go through this is that, hey, as things have changed, a lot of this has impacted interest rates. And hey, if we keep in mind, interest rates, those were a determinant of consumption. So, okay, we should be able to just rationalize as we go through this that changes in this liquidity preference framework are going to work through to affect the interest rate and thus are going to work through to affect our level of consumption. As our level of consumption changes, that's going to affect our Keynesian cross. As that Keynesian cross changes for a fixed price level, that's going to impact our aggregate demand model. So we'll see that things will all work through in that way. But let's let's explicitly evaluate it. And to explicitly evaluate it, let's take a look at a closed economy scenario here. So closed economy. And this is just our kind of our simple way so that we can take a look at it first. And that is we're going to presume that interest rates only affect consumption. That's the only thing that the interest rate impacts is just consumption. And then we'll move on to our more complex model and we'll talk about why that's not entirely true in its entirety. But we'll take a look at this closed, this closed economy version to start off. So in order to visualize this, we're actually gonna be drawing, uh, what is this gonna be six, five graphs all together. And we're going to interlay them all beside each other and draw lines to bounce off of each other so that we can view what's happening. Keep in mind, I'm never going to have you redraw this. This is going to be simply one of those cases that we take a look at here to kind of explain it. The redrawing of this is a never required, but the intuition behind it, being able to explain how one thing filters through to affect the other thing, that intuition, that explanation 
is going to be expected. So you never have to redraw the graph, but I do expect an understanding or an ability to re-explain the intuition. So let's start off with our liquidity preference framework. So with our liquidity preference framework, and let's just make that guy a bit bigger there. There we go. With our liquidity preference framework, we have the interest rate and our quantity of money. We have downward sloping, our money demand curve, and we have just completely vertical in this space. We have our money supply. Where this is equal, we get our, oh, let's use the actual rate tool for that. We have our equilibrium interest rate. We'll call that, uh, again, switching tools is difficult. There we go. We have our equilibrium interest rate, I star, and we have our quantity of money. We'll call that QM star. We have equilibrium. Now what we can do is we can kind of take a look at this relationship between interest rates and consumption. So that is we can draw another graph just to the right here and we'll say that this guy here is, well we'll share this axis. So that guy is interest rate and the horizontal axis, this is going to be my level of real consumption. Okay. We now need to work out what is our relationship between the interest rate and our level of consumption. Well, we already talked about this quite a bit going back to our Keynesian cross model. We talked about this quite a bit even in our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. We can think about it two ways. The ways to think about it are, hey, out of our entire disposable income, we can either consume it or we can save it. Right? And that'd be our real disposable income, either goes towards real consumption or real savings. If the interest rate is high, well, I'm going to be more enticed to save that money. So more money going towards savings, that's going to be less money going towards consumption. Alternatively, if the interest rate is low, I'm not going to be too enticed to save. So more money is going to be flowing towards the consumption side. So, okay, what do we get with that? We get with a high level of interest rate, we get a low level of consumption. And with a low interest rate, we get a high level of consumption. So we get this downward sloping relationship between the interest rate and our real consumption. So there we go. That's our real consumption function with respect to the interest rate. And then based off of this, right, this is just an arbitrary line in this bit, but what we can do is we can say based off of that, this interest rate is going to correspond to, uh, let's try to get that to line up properly, there we go. That interest rate is gonna go through to bounce off of and give us some level of consumption. So that is we're saying, okay, we witnessed this interest rate as determined through our liquidity preference framework. That interest rate is then taken. That's our I star. This interest rate then is going to determine this real level of consumption. Okay, great. So we've now determined real consumption as influenced by interest rates. We see that, hey, as interest rates go up, real consumption will go down. As interest rates go down, real consumption goes up. Well, what we want to do, and this next graph is just entirely arbitrary. This next graph we're going to draw is just strictly going to be real consumption, real consumption. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a 45 degree line such that real consumption equals real consumption. And that is all this graph serves to do is just to switch our axes so that we get real consumption from being on the horizontal axes to it being on the vertical axes. So that is if we draw this guy down, we get, let's use the right tool again. We draw that guy down, it hits the line, and we get our level of real consumption. 
So, okay, it just bounces it so that we get real consumption on a vertical. From here, our fourth graph. What do we have going on in our fourth graph here? Well, let's give this guy a draw. We're going to have over here our planned aggregate expenditure, that is our Keynesian cross model. And in our Keynesian cross model, of course, we're going to have this 45 degree line as well. That is, this is the point where real GDP equals our planned aggregate expenditure. And what we can do is we can drag over this real consumption bit all the way over as such. And we can think of this in one of two ways. We can either presume that, hey, real consumption is just part of autonomous consumption. And so, okay, that is, this would be my value of C. And then actual autonomous expenditure is somewhere up higher. Keeping in mind, right, consumption accounts for about 70% of GDP. So consumption is a good chunk of it. Or what we can do, and this is really the way that I like to draw this just to make it a bit simpler. We can wave our hands a little bit and we can presume, hey, consumption is 70% of autonomous. Let's just forget about investment, government expenditure, and exports. Just wave our hands, make them disappear. And we'll just presume, just for modeling sake here, we'll just presume that autonomous equals consumption. That is, this whole bit here, this real consumption, this is going to be the entirety of our autonomous expenditure. And I know that's a lie. I know that's an abstraction from reality. I know we have investment, government, exports as well. But consumption makes up the majority of it. And really what we're going to be modeling is changes in consumption. So because of that, any change in consumption is going to also equal a change in A. And this will be true even if we include investment, government expenditure, and exports. So it's a bit of hand-waving, it's a bit of simplification, but it's not a gross simplification that it violates our model. So we can make it without any loss of accuracy or any loss of information, any major loss of information at least. Okay, so from here then, if that's our autonomous expenditure, we have upward sloping our Keynesian cross model, so that guy there, that would be our planned aggregate expenditure. And again, this would be given some fixed price level. So, okay, there's our planned aggregate expenditure. Equilibrium level of national income. That occurs where planned aggregate expenditure equals GDP. So dragging that guy down, we end up getting our real Y prime. And I'll go real Y prime not. So we've worked through how this liquidity preference framework determines the interest rate. The interest rate then determines our consumption. Our consumption then determines our either the entirety or part of our autonomous. And thus our autonomous determines our Keynesian cross and our level of GDP, all else constant. Okay, we have one more graph to draw. We're not quite done yet. This one more graph to draw is, of course, our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And that is, if we start to fluctuate price levels all else equal, we get our aggregate demand. And what we would have is we would have our, oh, let's use the right tool again. There we go. We would have our aggregate demand downward sloping as such. Keeping in mind this value here, that guy there, let's draw that guy down again, there we go. That level of real GDP, that's going to be the value of real GDP at this fixed price level. All right, and what did we say up here? We said price level of 100, so there we go, price level of 100. And that price level and ultimately our macro short run macroeconomic equilibrium is determined where aggregate demand and aggregate supply intersect. There we go. That's roughly. So what we end up ultimately witnessing, interest rate to consumption. Consumption to autonomous to our Keynesian cross, determining our level of GDP. 
our level of GDP, determining our aggregate demand, and we're going to presume that this is at equilibrium, right? Our aggregate supply is exogenous in this case. It's outside of our system. We just drew our aggregate supply curve there specifically to presume that we're starting in our long-run equilibrium, or even our short-run equilibrium for that, mat for that matter. Okay. So what happens then? What happens if we begin to change stuff? Well, let's, let's work through that. Let's work through a change in our liquidity preference framework. And let's see how that change ends up cycling its way through to impact our macroeconomic equilibrium. So let's start off. Well, let's presume that through one method or another, I don't want to get into the mechanics of it, but let's presume that we decide to increase our money supply. So, right, one way that you could imagine this is that the Bank of Canada decides to start to print more money, and we have now more money in circulation. We'll get to how this happens and the mechanics of it in the next few weeks, but for now, let's just pretend, hey, Bank of Canada starts printing money, and they're just throwing it out of helicopters. So there we go, there's more money, and everybody has access to more money now. So that is our money supply shifts to the right so okay money supply shifts to the right we have our new money supply prime and we notice that hey at this new money supply prime keeping in mind whenever a curve shifts technically the old curve just completely ceases to exist so that is we have our new money supply ah uh, we have disequilibrium all right, we have right here, we have our money demanded. Right here, we have our quantity of money supplied. This is we have $100, but at this current interest rate, I only have a need for 80. So, okay, if I have $100 because I just caught a bunch of this money that was falling out of helicopters, but I only needed $80 for my day to day transactions, what do I do with this extra 20? Well, what do I do with this extra 20? I buy bonds. As I buy bonds, and as everybody is buying bonds, that looks like a U, that should be an O for bonds. As everybody is buying bonds, they begin to push up the price. As they begin to push up the price of bonds, it's going to cause the yield to maturity on these bonds, that is our interest rate, to fall. As our interest rate falls, our interest rate falls, our interest rate falls. It continues to fall until we arrive at a new equilibrium interest rate in our liquidity preference framework. So we have I star one. And again, right, this is at our new equilibrium point in our liquidity preference. Okay, so new lower interest rate, how does that translate? Well, lower interest rate means more consumption. Right, cheaper interest rate, I'm now discouraged from savings. Or the other way to think about it, cheap interest rate, it's really cheap to debt finance my consumption. So I'm going to increase, I'm going to increase my consumption. As I increase my consumption, well, let's bounce that off here. There we go. Let's just carry that all the way across. There we go, my consumption had increased. All else equal, that's gonna mean that I have a new higher level of autonomous. If my autonomous consumption's increased, my autonomous expenditure's increased. If my autonomous expenditure's increased, again, all else constant, that means I now have, assuming parallel lines, kind of drew that a little bit high up, we have our new planned aggregate expenditure given price level of 100 and given our new consumption due to our new interest rate. What does that work out to? Well, equilibrium, that occurs where GDP equals planned aggregate expenditure. So we take that, we draw that point down. We get our new real GDP, one, our real equilibrium level of national income due to our Keynesian cross at a fixed price level. That's the big thing, at a fixed price level. So that means for a fixed price level, I am now finding myself right here. 
Right, I'm now finding myself right here at this intersection of the price level and our new level of GDP. Well, hey, that's not on any curve. Why? Why is that not on any curve? Because what it means is that my aggregate demand has shifted out to the right. So, okay, so far, what has been the impact of this? We had a change in our money supply. Change in the money supply, increase in money supply meant that, hey, we had a disequilibrium. We decided to buy more bonds. As we bought more bonds, we pushed up the price of those bonds, causing the interest rates to collapse. As interest rates went down, it encouraged us to consume more. More consumption meant more autonomous consumption, meant more autonomous expenditure. More autonomous expenditure meant a shift in our Keynesian cross, which resulted in an increase in GDP, all for a fixed price level. If that's happening in our Keynesian cross for a fixed price level, then our aggregate demand curve increased, our aggregate demand curve shifted to the right. And we would have real Y prime one at this bid here. But notice now we have a disequilibrium in our macroeconomic equilibrium situation. So now we would have our short run adjustment where we would, right, we have all this excess demand for goods and services. Firms want to satisfy that, so they try to ramp up their output. As they ramp up their output, they also have to increase their prices. So firms begin to increase output and prices. You and I, we begin to react. We go, okay, cool. I want to buy that stuff, but at the higher price, I'm not able to buy quite as much as I once was able to. So we move along, both of them, until we arrive at our new short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. And at that new short run macroeconomic equilibrium, we get our new price level. We can call that something like 105. And our new final, we'll call that real GDP2, our real level of economic output, and the effect of that changing interest rate. So we see that, hey, by increasing the money supply, decreasing the interest rate, we, so let's, let's write that down. By increasing the money supply, this decreased the interest rate. What is the ultimate final cause of it? It caused the price level to rise, and it caused real GDP to rise. So we saw an increase in both of those due to this aggregate demand shock. Keep in mind, this is a short-run equilibrium. Now we would be in an expansionary output gap, all else equal. As we begin to adjust back to our long run, that's going to put farther pressure on price levels, causing price level to rise yet again. And right, if you want to think about, well, why is that the case? Presume our initial starting point at real Y prime naught. Let's presume that that was also our Y star, our potential GDP. That is right. Let's go like this. There we go. Let's say that that guy there, that was also our long run aggregate supply. So that is at this new short run equilibrium, Y prime is greater than Y star. That is, we're in this expansionary, this inflationary output gap. Hey, let's talk about that then. Y star is less than Y prime. So what does that mean? That means that our unemployment, our natural rate of unemployment is going to be greater than our actual rate of unemployment. Right? We're scraping the bottom of the barrel for our laborers. So in order to get good laborers, in order to keep our workers, in order to produce output, we begin to push up our wages. As wages begin to rise, higher wages, that's a higher factor price, higher factor prices, that's going to affect our aggregate supply curve, aggregate supply begins to adjust back to our long run equilibrium and as it adjusts back to our long run equilibrium let's just shift to this existing guy we would end up back all the way right there such that we are right back at y prime we'll call that y prime three equals y star and what was the only final effect of this increase in money supply the only final effect of this increase in money supply, that was terrible. Let's try that again. 
the only final effect of that increase in money supply was an increase in the price level. So what we witness in this case here is that changing around with our interest rates, changing around with the quantity of money in the economy, it does have real impacts, right? It affects the interest rate. It then works through to affect consumption and all of that. It has a short run boom in our output. We saw that, right? We saw that short run boom as output went up, came down to our short run equilibrium, and then adjusted finally all the way down to our long run equilibrium. But it is short lived. We will, through our natural adjustment process, always make our way back to potential. So it's just a short run fix. The long run effects of changing around with it is entirely inflationary is entirely inflationary. By increasing our money supply, by decreasing interest rates, the only long run impact was an increase in price level. Now that everybody has more money, everybody can buy more stuff. That is, you can think about if there's more money in circulation, every dollar is now kind of worth less than it used to be worth. As a result of that, all the prices have to get cranked up in order to maintain kind of that price to total money in circulation ratio. So what we would say based off of this, we would say that all of this demonstrates what is known as our long run money neutrality. And that is that, hey, in the long run, any impacts, any changes, this is the long run neutrality of money, any changes in our money supply, any changes in our liquidity preference framework, Yes, they filter through to have a short run impact. The only long run impact that is possible to be had due to changes in our liquidity preference framework, due to changes in the quantity of money in circulation, interest rates, etc., the only long run impact is in the price level. And that is to quote Milton Friedman, or rather to paraphrase Milton Friedman, is that inflation always and everywhere is a monetary event. That, hey, it's always due, not always, but it is often due, primarily due to changes in the amount of money we have in circulation. We can influence money supply. We can influence things with our liquidity preference framework. They have real short-run impacts, no real long-run impact. It only affects prices in the long run. In fact, we find that the correlation between changes in money supply and i should say percent changes in money supply and inflation is about 0.94 that is a for every let's just go ridiculous plus 10 percent in the money supply we would typically witness a 9.4 percent change in inflation in the long run that has been historically the relationship between changes in money supply and changes in price level. So pretty stable relationship and actually a relationship that we will monopolize on in the coming videos in order to explain how the Bank of Canada and not even the Bank of Canada, how central banks around the world utilize monetary policy to be able to influence economic outcomes. And we'll discuss what their mandates are as well in that. Okay, so this whole model, this whole effect as we saw it, keep in mind what we presumed in this was that this was for a closed economy. That is that the interest rate only affected consumption. In reality, it's going to be more complex than this. It's going to affect a lot more things than this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be taking a look at that. Now, mind you, what that means is I can't draw these fancy diagrams with all these balancing lines everywhere. We just have to walk through, talk through, and kind of do a chalk talk as to what's happening. So let's go through and talk about that and what we're going to do is we're going to go through the same kind of scenario that is what we're going to presume is that we've had this same impact in our liquidity preference framework that is we have had an increase in the money supply causing a decrease in the interest rate and we'll talk through we'll walk through what that all means if the interest rate affects more than just consumption so let's jump over, let's take a look at that. So what did we say? We said, just so that we can refer back to it, our money supply increased and that caused our equilibrium interest rate to fall. Okay, 
our falling interest rate, we already worked through what that ends up causing. That ends up causing our consumption, again, keep in mind this is actually real consumption, to rise. Now, what other variables are going to be impacted by this? Well, what we can keep in mind by invoking our Fisher equation is that the nominal interest rate is going to be, well, there's going to be a relationship between the nominal and the real interest rate. And that is that our real interest rate is going to equal our nominal plus, uh, sorry, not plus, uh, there we go, our nominal interest rate minus our expected rate of inflation. So changes in price level altogether. That is, hey, any change in the nominal interest rate for a fixed rate of inflation, right? Not even fixed price level, just constant inflation. If this increases and this stays the same, well, this guy will also increase. So that is, we're going to tend to witness, at least in the short run, we're going to tend to witness nominal and real interest rates moving together. So what we're going to witness with that then is that, hey, if real consumption goes up due to this drop in interest rates, real interest rates, well, okay, I just drew them going up here. Same is true the other way. If nominal interest rates go down, so then does the real. So, hey, if nominal interest rates go down, real interest rates go down as well. Real interest rates, well, real interest rates, that was one of our determinants of business investment. Lower real interest rate, well, again, that's going to be more business investment. It's going to be cheaper to finance these big infrastructure projects or these big uh, new factory building or acquirement of capital, etc. So just like how real consumption went up, our investment went up as well. So we have this happening. We have more consumption. We have more investment. What else does this mean? Well, what also needs to happen is we kind of need to go and we need to think about our capital flows. And we can go through and we can mathematically show this by saying, hey, more consumption, more investment means less savings, less savings, right? Because more consumption means less savings. So, okay, less savings, more investment. Uh, how is this all going to work itself through? Or we can just kind of walk through, talk through without all the math bits happening. And that is we just think about it from an international saver's point of view. Okay, so let's say from an international saver's point of view, we'll kind of take a look at it ah, very simply here. Let's say we have an interest rate in Canada and we have an interest rate in the USA, right? Each of these, this is the I star. And to start off, we'll presume that they're equal. Arthur will presume that, hey, it's equivalent risk. There's, we're going to just wave our hands and say there's no or marginal exchange rate risk between the two, meaning that, hey, as an international saver, eh, I'm indifferent right now between saving my money in Canadian bonds or saving my money in American bonds, right? I'd, I'd be indifferent between those two. But then the Canadian money supply increases. This increase in the Canadian money supply pushes down the Canadian interest rate. As that pushes down the Canadian interest rate, well, now all of a sudden I'm going to have the interest rate in Canada is less than the interest rate in the USA. Meaning now, if I want to, as an international saver, put my money somewhere, well, it doesn't look like I'm getting a very good yield to maturity off of Canadian bonds, right? I'm looking at this. I'm going, ah, Canadian bonds don't look very attractive. American bonds are paying a higher yield. If I were to choose between the two, would I rather put money in a low yield one or a high yield one, assuming equivalent risk and all the rest? Well, between the two, I'd rather receive a higher yield. So what begins to happen? We begin to sell our Canadian bonds, we begin to move into money, and then we begin to buy U.S. bonds. But to think about this, to think about what's happening, we are selling Canadian bonds to buy U.S. bonds. That is, we are selling Canadian dollars to buy U.S. dollars. 
So all of that across the board, we have a sale of Canadian dollars. People are selling Canadian dollars. They're saying, yep, I'm out of the Canadian marketplace. I am out of here. I don't want Canadian bonds. So I need to get rid of my Canadian dollars because that's what Canadian bonds are priced in. As I sell my Canadian bonds, well, this is the same kind of situation. Who's buying my Canadian money? Well, by far and large, we're kind of net sellers of Canadian money here. People are leaving, their financial capital is leaving Canada. So we don't have a lot of people buying Canadian money. So in order to sell Canadian money, you need to start selling Canadian dollars at discount. As all this happens, the Canadian dollar would begin to depreciate. Right? Because we're trying to get out of Canadian money into U.S. money the Canadian dollar would begin to depreciate. Okay, as the Canadian dollar depreciate, what, what does this all mean? Well, this means a change in relative prices. So what happens with this change in relative prices? Depreciating Canadian dollar. Well, let's see, like think of it from the Canadian context. U.S. goods look expensive. So, hey, U.S. goods look expensive. I, I don't want to buy U.S. stuff anymore. So what does that mean? That means my imports go down. On the flip side, from the U.S. perspective, that is the foreign perspective, Canadian goods, they now look cheap because our dollar is depreciated. So our stuff looks cheap to them because it's really easy to buy Canadian dollars. It's very cheap to buy Canadian dollars. So very cheap to buy Canadian goods. So what does that mean? That means that our exports go up. So, okay, working all this through, what does that mean? We have real exports going up and we have our marginal propensity to import, right? That's our imports there going down. So how does this all work out for us? Well, all of this, that translates to higher autonomous expenditure. So this guy here, smaller marginal propensity to import, that translates into a higher marginal propensity to spend. All of this together, what, is that, what does that end up doing for us? Well, if we just take a look at our Keynesian cross, land aggregate expenditure, real GDP, We'll throw in our 45 degree line there. That's our equilibrium condition, right? So that's real GDP equals planned aggregate expenditure. We'll start off with our level of autonomous. We will take a look at our, go something like that, our planned aggregate expenditure. That's going to be given a fixed price level. And we observe our equilibrium level of national income. We'll call that Y prime not. Okay, so this is our initial case before money supply increased, before our interest rates dropped. And then we have our shock in our liquidity preference framework like we saw here. So we can't just boom flow through in this nice way because we have a lot more going on. We don't just have only interest rate affecting consumption. We now have this interest rate affecting consumption, investment, exports, imports, right? A lot more happening. And keep in mind, why is it affecting exports and imports? Because it's affecting our capital flows, because it's affecting our capital flows, causes us to sell Canadian dollars, causing the Canadian dollar to depreciate. The depreciating Canadian dollar changes relative prices, which changes our exports and our imports, right? Quite, quite an involved process here. Okay, but final, final kind of outcome. What does this all work out to? Well, we, we see this here. C, I, X, they're all up. That's autonomous is now higher. So, okay, let's do that. We've had an increase in autonomous. We have a decrease in our marginal propensity to import. So, okay, and if you don't see why that's an increase in our marginal propensity to spend, let's just take a look at that quickly. Or uh, let's change color because I'm use, already using that color over there. Here we go. Marginal propensity to spend. That guy there, that's equal to our marginal propensity to consume 1 minus the tax rate minus M. So, okay, maybe maybe that's still not popping for you as to why that's the case. So let's just throw some numbers in it. 
let's just presume that this guy is 0 0.70. And then our marginal propensity import, let's say this is 0 0.10. So, okay, all together, that works out to us. We would get a marginal propensity to spend of 0.7 minus 0.1. 0.6. So, okay, that's our marginal propensity to spend, right? And where do those numbers come from? I just made them up for demonstrative purposes. Okay, then we have our change. So, we still have, right? Keep in mind, I didn't change marginal propensity to consume. I didn't change our tax rate. So, those guys are good. Marginal propensity to import change, though, right? We said M goes down. So, let's just, let's just be bold. Let's say this goes down to 0 0.05. Well, okay, if that goes down, 0 0.7 minus 0 0.05, what's my new marginal propensity to spend? 0 0.65. That is, hey, this is a bigger number, a bigger marginal propensity to spend. Bigger number means a steeper aggregate expenditure. So steeper aggregate expenditure, let's kind of keep that in mind. Something like that would be a parallel shift just to change an A. So if we go steeper, let's be bold again, let's go something like that. This would be our new planned aggregate expenditure given a fixed price level. And then what's changed in this case? Oh my goodness, we've had a change in consumption, investment, exports, and imports, right? So given all of our new consumption one, investment one, exports one, marginal propensity to import one. Oh, that's an awful. New equilibrium level of GDP. There we go. Y prime one, we see again an increase in our output altogether. Now keep in mind, just by having this open economy, including these exports and these imports into it, this is gonna be a bigger effect than if we had had our closed economy, right? This is gonna have a lot more impact on our macroeconomic equilibrium. From here though, from here, though, we can actually just jump back and take a look at it like we had before. That is, if we take a look back here, we had an increase in GDP due to our Keynesian cross, right? Okay, A changed and marginal propensity to spend change. So a little bit different, but the outcome was increase in GDP. So, okay, increase in GDP caused a shift of our aggregate demand curve. And then, hey, come that shift in our aggregate demand curve, everything else flowed through the same. So that is really end of the story. If you just go start of the story to end of the story, there's no difference. Start of the story, money supply increased, interest rate fell. Money supply increased, interest rate fell. Result of it, price level went up, real GDP went up, inflationary output gap, Okay, we begin to adjust back. End effect is only an increase in price level. That's still true, right? Just like we said in the, long, in the other case, that's our long run neutrality of money. So same story. The difference is, the only difference is how we got from this to that. In our closed economy case, it was just interest rate to consumption to GDP. In our full open economy case, our full monetary transmission mechanism is changing our money, affecting our interest rate, ends up affecting consumption, investment. Change in interest rate ends up changing international savings, causing a flight of capital, causing an appreciation of the dollar, causing a change in our relative prices, causing a change in our exports and our imports, which just reinforces our change in consumption and investment, boosting GDP, and again, causing aggregate demand to shift to the right. So same end story. The big difference is in the explanation of our monetary transmission mechanism. That is how a change in the interest rate filters through to affect our economy on whole. Between the two, this one, well, okay, we got this big complicated graph, but we can think about it intuitively to work through. This one's just kind of our baby step to introduce the concept. What we're really going to be utilizing whenever we discuss, whenever we try to explain and work through our monetary transmission mechanism is that other case, the full open economy version. So again, the outcome, 
start to end is the same. It's the process that is different. Okay, so in this video, what have we looked at? Through this session, we have built this understanding that individuals within an economy face a trade-off between holding bonds and money. Using this trade-off, we built up the basis of our liquidity preference framework, and we witnessed that, hey, based off of the amount of money supplied versus how much we want to demand, right, presuming we want to demand money and then bonds being kind of that residual other side of things, we determined a equilibrium interest rate. And then we use that equilibrium interest rate and that equilibrium in our liquidity preference framework to filter through to see how it influences the greater economy in both the short run and the long run. That is primarily, we witness that in the short run, it can have real impacts to GDP. However, in the long run, the only impact is changes in price level. If you have any questions on anything we covered, Please feel free, you can either comment below, you can post to the D2L board, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Until next time.